Let's pray together tonight before they sing again. Ask the Lord to help us. Heavenly Father, thank you again for the privilege to pray. Thank you, Lord, that you made it possible that old sorry sinners like us can come boldly to the throne of grace. We thank you for the blood of Jesus that makes that possible. Lord, I pray that you'd help us tonight to hear from you. Bless the choir. Bless all the singing tonight. Be with Brother Mark as he'll stand. And Lord, we thank you for he and his wife and the 30 years in Africa. Lord, the souls that have been saved, the churches that have been started. Thank you for letting us uh, meet each other all them years ago. How you supernaturally worked that out that we might become co-laborers with them. Thank you for the trip we were able to take there years ago. And the church that's still going strong. We praise you for all this. Help us to rejoice in it tonight, Lord, and celebrate what good things you've done and allowed us to be a part of. And I do pray for the preaching that you'd use him, Lord, to deal with us, convict us, help us, comfort us, all the things that we need. We pray that you'd do those for us tonight. Be with those, Lord, whose uh, names will be called out here in a few minutes. Brother Ken and myself will be giving prayer requests. We pray for Miss Julie. We ask you to be with her. Thank you that she went home today from the hospital. But we pray that you'd give the doctor's wisdom and guidance as it goes forward. Help Miss Kim also, Lord, as we wait. Uh, the next set of tests for her, that they'd be good. And then when they get ready to do the procedure to help her with the cancer, that it would be, uh, Lord, the least invasive and uh, would be no chemotherapy or radiation needed, if that be your will. But we're thankful that you do answer our prayers. We're thankful that you hear us and answer us. What a blessing that is. And Lord, we need you to help us tonight. We need your spirit. We want your spirit. All is vain unless the spirit of the Holy One comes down. So we invite you, Holy Ghost, to help us tonight. Uh, Lord, I pray that you clear out our minds and hearts of anything that might be a hindrance. And Lord, speak to us in your service as you'd see fit. We'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Sing it again.
Thank you, Lord, for the strength you give to simply carry on through life's tools and tests in the worst and best. I'm not ever left alone. You're always right beside me. You hear me every time I pray. And since I first began, you've been my dearest friend, and I just want to give you thanks. thanks. I give you you give. I am blessed abundantly. I will never forget that moment when in my life you made such a change. And since your spirit came, I've not been the same. And I just want to give you thanks. Thanks. I give you thanks for all you Shake hands with somebody around you there. Praise the Lord. course together here when she gets around to it. Thanks, thanks. I give you thanks. Everybody sing it from your heart. Here we go now. Push it out. Thanks, thanks. Sing it. I give you thanks for all, for all you've done. I am so blessed. My soul has found rest. time and no music. One more time and no music. Sing your parts now. Find a part. Thanks, thanks. Sing it. I give you thanks for all you've done. I am so blessed. My soul has found rest. Oh, Lord, I give you thanks. Now grab your hymn book. We'll sing together. What number, Brother Kenneth? The back cover. I've never been sorry. Praise the Lord that I trusted his name. Is that what it is? All right, fellas, we get a part on this one. We're the praise the Lord's. All right, we got the easy part. Praise the Lord. So sing it out good and loud. I'm sure most of you are like me. There's a lot of things we have been sorry that we did. But trusting the Lord has never been one of them. I'm thankful I trusted him with my soul when I was a young boy. And I'm thankful I trusted him with my life when I was a young adult. And I thank God for everything he's done for me since. Let's pray back and sing it out.
got uh, we got camp camp meeting mission conference every night this week and uh, uh, Tuesday night seven o'clock Wednesday night seven o'clock and of course tomorrow night all right Monday Tuesday and Wednesday we're having church at seven o'clock hopefully I will get these announcements out straight um, <clears throat> but just so that everybody knows this flag over here represents Brother Caleb Hewling. Where are you sitting at, brother? Right here. And uh, he has a new pastor just starting a church out in Colorado, and that's what that flag stands for. And uh, this is for Nigeria, Brother Mark Sixtad, and he will be preaching for us in just a minute. We love him. And then this uh, British flag is for Brother Stagner. They will be with us tomorrow. And uh, this one over here with multiple nations represents Brother Theoros. They are, uh, have been missionaries for 30 years, and they are now starting a new ministry of uh, ministering to missionaries. Uh, so we appreciate them. All right, do remember that tomorrow night at 7. For you that are feeding people, if you got any questions, hopefully we've got all that worked out. Come and talk to me about that. All right, got a couple of prayer requests. Um, do pray for Miss Judy DeWitt's daughter. Her name is Elizabeth, and we've mentioned her several months back as a, she is uh, pregnant with twins and at very high risk. And tomorrow she's going in the hospital for at least, hope the Lord willing, six weeks or until she is uh, delivered. Uh, so pray the Lord to watch over her, uh, that there's no more complications than there already is. And then be praying for uh, Miss Kelly Waycaster. She is getting some results back tomorrow for some tests. Pray that those come back. Uh, with nothing serious. And then also for Brother Dwayne and the Gracie. Have you heard anything from those tests? Gonna, tumor going to have the tumor removed on the 14th? No results on the biopsy. All right, so be, be praying for uh, that situation there. All right, let's go ahead and have our rushers come forward, and we will take a party in and off. Sunday night children getting change offering so we'll do just like we normally do let me give you a couple of other prayer requests while we're getting ready for that Miss Julie Sweeney did come home from the hospital today and so I want to keep praying for her she's got to, I think see a specialist and uh, they'll figure out uh, they, I mean they're looking at possibly doing some more surgery again on her she's had surgery several times uh, several times in this same issue with some of her stomach and stuff so pray for her and uh, as I said this morning, they've just kind of been going through quite a bit and a pretty, little bit discouraged maybe. So text and call and check in on them. Try to see if you can be a blessing there. And then Miss Kim Blake is uh, also going to have to have a few more tests. She did get diagnosed this week with cancer. Uh, they think it's contained to the point that they can just do a surgery and remove it. And that's what we're praying. Now, there's, they're going to have to look into that. They'll do another scan. This uh, Is it this week, the big scan for everything? And so uh, this week they're going to do a scan to just see if it's spread, if it's anywhere else in the body. They don't think it is, but they do that as a precaution. So pray that that goes well and then that when they decide on the treatment that it is that uh, ability just to take it out, remove it without even the need of ra radiation or chemotherapy, if the Lord will. Miss Nancy was here this morning. She's awaiting uh, her final scan after, of course, having received all of her treatments. Are she here right now too? There she is right over there. She was here this morning, and she's here tonight. Praise the Lord. Still waiting on that scan. I believe, is it February? Is it going to be in the oh, March? They just keep putting her off, so keep praying for her on that. And then uh, the Yarboroughs have been sitting right over here uh, by Miss Patty when they get, were able to make it, to, and uh, they have had um, a lot of sickness in the last few months. But then also, last night, was it, Miss Patty? Last night, uh, in the middle of the night, a tree fell on their house, and they're an older couple. And uh, it uh, scared them to death, and it busted uh, part of the roof and done a lot of damage. And so I want you to be praying for them, and it actually made her heart rhythm get messed up. It was such a, a jolt to them. And so I want you to be praying for them, and we may need to help them. Uh, Miss Patty's in contact with them. Uh, physically, we might need some ladies to go up if it works out that way and just help her pack up some stuff in her house. They say when they try to remove the tree, it could come on through. And so uh, they're wanting to. She wants to get a bunch of the stuff out of her, maybe of her living room, things she's collected through the years and stuff. And so I told Miss Patty to tell her that if we need to, we can try to get some people there. And so we'll, we may be sending out a church call to ask if somebody could go and do that when we find out. So be praying for them. If you have any of their contact information, maybe you could check on them as well. Brother Nathan Reed was here this morning. I don't think he's back tonight, is he? And uh, we've been praying for them. They're here to uh, get some medical help for their daughter. And uh, he gave me a pretty good report this morning that the doctors here in America think she's going to be fine. But continue to pray for them as they're traveling around here now while they're here for just a little bit. 
Oh, let's see here. I believe that's all the prayer requests. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can pray. As I said earlier, we thank you, Lord, that you're an all-powerful, all-knowing God that cares about us and cares about our troubles and trials. I'm thankful that you're touched with the feelings of our infirmities. And we do pray that you'd bless these folks that are going through these troubles and trials. We pray that you'd touch these that are having physical problems. We ask you to give the doctors wisdom and guidance and uh, bless them and take care of them, uh, Lord, as they take care of our people. And I pray that you'd give them the right answers and the right decisions. Lord, we do pray for your grace on these folks where I didn't mention CJ's mom. I pray that you'd bless her as she's recovering. Uh, I pray that you'd touch her and help the doctors there as well and all these others that are awaiting test results. We ask you for a good biopsy. Uh, Lord, on the little baby, baby Gracie, we pray that you'd give a good report there. And then help Miss Kim as she goes further in these tests that it would be, uh, Lord, not spread. That they could just remove it and be done with it at that, we pray. Bless the Yarboroughs, Lord, that they're going through a tough time in many ways. Pray that you'd be with them. Bless our service tonight. Multiply these offerings as you'd see fit. We'll give you the praise for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, children, go ahead. Brother Mark, come on up here. Anybody got change that nobody's taken yet? Anybody else? All oh, right here. We need somebody right there. Get me a child up, Brother Jason. Get, Brandon's loaded. Get all the money Brandon and Christy got. Praise He's probably got gold coins. Anybody else? Don't give us none of them casino tokens. I did get one of them an offering plate one week. Brother Ray. Brother Ray and them counted the money and brought it to me and said, Preacher, look at here. I thought, boy... I didn't know what to do with it. To be honest with you, I said, I guess God wants me to go invest it. <laughs> I didn't go invest it. Good Lord. Cole, you got that? Was there one in there? What's the name on it? That's it. That's what I was wanting, the whirlies. I wanted to mention a couple things to you, then uh, we're going to sing Congregational Together. Miss Scott, if you want to climb them steps again, sorry about that. <laughs> I, I didn't catch you. I'm really sorry. I know you got bad days like myself. And, I apologize. We've got uh, some things the Lord has done for us recently in the church uh, with missions that some of you don't know that I wanted to go ahead and tell you about. Uh, most of you know Brother Jim and Miss Mary. Raise your hand over there, Brother Jim and Miss Mary. These are the Doyles. They moved down here from Rochester or Buffalo. Which one was it? Rochester. I met them at the Youth of Blaze. I'll be going there in just a few weeks to preach that youth meeting again. And I met them there, and the Lord you know, connected us, and they eventually decided to retire and move here. And, uh, but what most people don't know is that they really don't plan to be here very much. They have a desire to go and fill in for missionaries. They want to take now their retirement years and at their own expense and go and uh, fill in for missionaries who need to come home for a few months or need to do so much like, I guess, what you guys are talking about doing. And uh, Brother Jim and Miss Mary have already got some things they've been working on. They were supposed to go, I think, in maybe April. And, and I think that one has had trouble on the missionary side. They might not go there. But I praise the Lord for that. They want to go and just be a blessing and, and going out of our church. So that's exciting. And then also the Worley family have been coming. When they come, they normally sit right back in there a little bit in front of where Brother Curtis is. And uh, they're not here a whole lot because they're in the missions as well. They are mission movers. 
And uh, for 20 years or so, they have just uh, been in the ministry of helping missionaries move to where they're going. Just like Brother Wayne, one of these days, you know, is going to go out west maybe in a year or so, start a church there in Washington State. The Whirlies will probably participate in that. They'll help them pack all their stuff up. And they don't just do it in America. They help get stuff to foreign lands as well. And uh, they feel like the Lord's uh, planting them in here. They won't be here a whole lot, but they want to be out of our church. And uh, that's been exciting, and that's been a blessing as well. And then, of course, as I just mentioned, just recently, Brother Wayne has stood and told you that he feels like the Lord has called them to go and start a church in Washington State. And I might have him tell a little bit more about what the Lord's done in the last few weeks. So we've made a real good contact out there with some uh, preachers that are in that area that also have a burden for the Seattle area. And so God's blessing our church. I praise the Lord for that. And we want to reach the world. We want to do our part, as the preacher was saying this morning. And I've told you many times, Acts 1-8 has those four areas that every Christian is responsible to try to help reach. Not just Christianity as a whole, but every individual Christian, I believe, is supposed to find a way to participate in Judea and Samaria, in, you know, Judea and what's the next one? Jerusalem, Jerusalem Judea, Samaria. I'm skipping Jerusalem. Forget them Jews, praise. No, we don't. We want the Jews. They're good. And uh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts. And not only every individual Christian, but then an individual church. Try to reach it all. And so I praise the Lord that he's helping us. He's helping us, giving us influence and expanding our influence. And I praise the Lord for that. We're going to have Brother Mark come in just a second. But why don't we all stand and we'll be the special. Let's do it as well, my soul. We'll be the special tonight together. 159, I believe it is. Is that right, Brother Kim? Somewhere around in there. Look at 159 and see if that's it. 41 years old. Is that it? Look at there, son. Mine like an iron trap, steel trap, whatever it is. I don't remember what the saying is, but I remember 159. Is it as well with my soul? Praise God. Let's sing it like we mean it now. You realize, as I've said before, nobody else in the world can say this and really it be true except the born-again Christian. The Buddhists, they can't say it. The, the, the Muslims, that I mean, that Muslim that's flying that plane and giving his life is just hoping. He's just hoping what he's been told is true. And the sad truth is he's waking up in hell. Sadly. But you, you that have been saved by the grace of God, by the blood of Jesus Christ, you can lay down tonight and know that if you stop breathing while you're sleeping, you'll start breathing in heaven and it is well with your soul. We also know this, that if we wake up and all of our problems are still here, we can have peace in the middle of all of our problems because we have a true and a living God that cares and that hears and that answers. So let's sing it like we know what we're talking about. When peace like a river. When peace like a river attends. Sing it now. When sorrows like sea. Push it out, whatever. Sing it is well, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance. Church.
feeling. Let's sing it. And Lord haste the day when the faith God's people say it. Yeah. Amen. Good singing today. That sounds good up here, don't it, preacher? Standing up here in front of them, that's good stuff. Brother Mark's going to come in just a minute, do a couple different things. I want you to relax, give him plenty of time tonight. We want him to present. We've got a different presenter each night in the conference, so we wanted to give him a chance tonight to tell what's been going on. And I know he did some in Brother Matt's class this morning, and he'll probably show the same, I guess, the same DVD or whatever they showed in there to the rest of us tonight. And uh, he shared with some of you today that were here this morning that we helped start a church there. How many years ago was that, brother? Seven years ago, we went there and took a big crowd and uh, visited all week, soul one all week, and got a bunch of people to get saved and then uh, helped start a new church. On the same Sunday, he celebrated the 20th anniversary of the first church. I believe that was the first church that we uh, helped go across town and start a new one on the same day. It was a blessing. And uh, he's telling us about that this morning, how good that church is doing. So hopefully he'll tell us a little more about that. And then uh, I've asked him to tell uh, a couple of stories, at least one just uh, something crazy. I, I, I mentioned, and he may be going to tell it, but I remember the first time he came talking about that, that uh, witch doctor cutting the head off that chicken and throwing chicken blood all over him. How many of y'all remember that one? <laughs> and I remember that story. And he said, you've never lived that you've had chicken blood thrown all over you. And so we don't know anything about living by faith like that. And I believe that night the Lord protected you as well and supernaturally protected him as they were coming to kill him that night. They told him later and uh, just something wouldn't let him do that. So I praise the Lord for that. that and he's going to give some kind of story, tell you something, and then he'll uh, show the DVD, talk a little bit about the ministry, somewhere in the middle of that, tell us a good story, and then he's going to preach. All right. So I want you to give him a good time tonight. Thank you for praying last night. We had a good trip with the youth. Had nine saved that service there and uh, got to hear a tremendous message. I, I text that preacher and thanked him. I'm glad my own children, not just our youth, but I'm glad my children got to hear him preach that message last night and I praise the Lord for that. Nine saved there and then Brother Allen had some saved at the jail this afternoon so we thank God for that. Let me see here. Two more things then we'll let Brother Mark go ahead and come. We need more nursery help for the conference in the next few nights. Miss Miranda's sitting right here. Raise your hand Miss Miranda. Right there. Miss Miranda sitting beside Brother Matt. She needs more help in the nursery for the conference. I need some ladies to come please talk to her after the service and let's go ahead. Do you know how many you might need? Needs several. All right, need several. That means several of you, all right? So, bunch of you, many of you. Say amen. 
All right, so come talk to her. We won't make you do it more than once, Lord willing. If enough of you will come, you can uh, not miss a bunch of stuff, but we do need some help with that. And then last of all, we didn't mention today Miss Kelly Waycaster, still recovering, I guess, from her surgery. You doing all right, sister? Still need some prayer, though, right? All right, she's still got some things going on, some questions unanswered still with her physical issues. So I want you to pray for Miss Kelly that the Lord would help her as well. Okay, a lot of things I know to pray about. Try to remember them. Try to pray for them. All right, next Sunday, so not Wednesday night. All right, we'll be giving you the Faith Promise cards next Sunday. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the next couple of nights. But that's just something you to be praying about this week, what the Lord would have you give weekly or monthly to missions. That's how we support those who are out on the wall. People just pledge. You don't write your name on it. It just gives us an idea about how much we're going to have to spend for that. And, of course, it's all by faith even on our part as well. But you pray about it, and we'll do that next Sunday. All right, Brother Mark, you come. Pastor Mark, I guess we call you, right? Yes, sir. Pastor Mark, turn this off. There we go. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, my friend. Thank God you, bless preacher. You. Yes, sir. Uh, it's hard when the pastor says, tell a story. Um, because I've got to be careful what I say, because we've got a mixed group. But, you know, in Africa, uh, it's a, now, now you, you want a crazy story, all right? Um, you know, in Africa, things are a little different. And, and as, a, as a missionary... Uh, you know, sometimes it, we learn a lot as we go. Uh, you know, and, and the things that you and I take for granted uh, is, is not always uh, how it is in other places of the world. Um, and, and so, you, you know, and, and you understand, people around the world have different um, standards of, of dress. They have different standards of what they consider modesty. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, one of the, now, now this is a funny story to me, all right? And there are times when a missionary, as he looks over his life, there's a time that sometimes the missionary just gets on his knees and says, thank God nobody had a camera. Um, <laughs> because I, I have done things, all right, that, you know, that, that in the learning process, and even uh, in, in the course of uh, teaching now, uh, there's, there's things that, that we have to do. When we first started out, um, I did not know how to baptize. I knew how to baptize in a nice tank. But there is, there, baptizing in the Atlantic Ocean is different. Uh, you have to baptize, you know, in a proper direction. Um, and, and understand, I, the, 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 when I say proper direction, you have to watch the waves. Because if you baptize... Uh, when a you know when a wave is is coming in, um, you know you can get knocked off your feet. Uh, I will tell you this: one thing I learned very quickly is you know you do not baptize in waders in an ocean uh, because they have a tendency to fill up, which is really exciting uh, because then you can't move. And when you baptize in the ocean, you know you watch the wave come in, and and if the wave is coming this way. All right, you, got, you want to baptize into that wave at the right time so that you don't drown a person because it's hard to get them up. And by the way, you got to be careful that you don't baptize them after the wave comes because there's kind of like a backwash. Uh, you know, and there are times, and, and the worst case scenario is when uh, somebody feels like they're drowning and they grab you. Do not baptize in a necktie. All right? Do not baptize in necktie. And, and understand, we don't, you know, when you're baptizing in an ocean, uh, you do things uh, a little different. And so, uh, Linda and I, we, we helped start a church in, in, the, in Lagos. Um, all right? You went to the, when you were in Nigeria, you went to the palace. Uh, Pastor Dosumu. And Pastor Dosumu's church was in Lagos, and I helped him start it. I preach every church that Pastor Dosumu has started. Now, he's a king now, Oba Dosumu. Uh, and, uh, but... Um, we started, helped him start a church in Lagos, and we had some of his converts, and so we were going to baptize in the ocean, and uh, not a whole lot of people on the beach, you don't have to worry about that, and so I, you know, I took the men and the, the ladies, and we, we had a bus, uh, a van, big van, and we sent them, and we told them, now, we want you to get clothes, change into clothes that we can baptize you in. You know, and, and you know, and, now that's, you know, it's, you have to understand, they're not independent Baptists. Now, I learned this, right? I learned the hard way. 
And so, you know, and, and so we, we had the bus, and so we went to, I went to the lagoon. We're standing there at the Lagos Lagoon, and, and, you know, the bus comes, and they had their clothes, and they changed behind trees. Now, we had the men in one bus. They came first. You know, the guys changed behind the trees. Uh, now, by the way, just so you know, I have baptized naked people. So how do you do that? Very quickly. All right. Uh, very uh, very quickly, I mean, we had, a, we, had a, we had a young man who just didn't have anything, but he wanted to get baptized. What are you going to do? I mean, you baptize him, quick, you know, but it's embarrassing. And so we had to, don't laugh, preacher. Someday, you know, I'm going to do that. You're going to do it, all right? And so, um, and so, so we baptized the man, and they got in the bus, and they went, and then they brought the ladies. And one of the ladies, Linda, had one to the Lord, and she was, a, uh, she was about like a 19-year-old university student. And she went back to the university, and I understand she's a very naive young lady. She's not worldly wise. She's a true, lovely Nigerian young lady. Had a good heart. And Linda won her to the Lord, and that young lady went to the university, and she was rummaging around her room looking for clothes to wear. Her roommate was a very worldly Nigerian girl. And so, you know, the, room, her, she's, the girl is, we're going to baptize, she's rummaging around looking for clothes to wear to get baptized. And her roommate says, what are you doing? And she said, well, we're going to Lagos Lagoon. I'm getting baptized. Her roommate, all her roommate heard was Lagos Lagoon, which is the beach. And so her roommate said, I've got something for you. This will be perfect to wear at the beach. So she gave her clothes to be baptized in. So the ladies came, and Linda was there. She had the towels for the ladies. And I have to get far enough out into the ocean where it's not a strain for me to get them under and up. Because I do not want the night. What the Nigerians do is they want to force themselves back and then their feet come up and you're supporting them. Yeah. I want them just to keep their feet on the ground, just go back and up. Yeah. Now, we do have one of our pastors that does what I call baptism by violence, <laughs> uh, where, they, where they start. You know, the, the baptism is like, you know, they're, they're going to be baptized this way, but they start forward. In obedience to the command of our Lord, and then they go, boom, you know, and water for the first 12 rows. That's what I call baptism by violence. And uh, so anyway, you know, we got people like that. So I'm far enough out that I'm going to baptize people the easy way. Well, the last young lady that was to get baptized was the girl from the university. And so she comes out, this lovely black young lady comes out with a pink bikini. <laughs> My wife looks at me and, you know, has no words of encouragement for me. She looks at me and basically said, this is your fault. Uh, and it was, because I didn't explain what extra clothes were. I say, what did you do? Listen, she wants to get baptized. She's not trying to embarrass anybody, and in her mind, she's not immodest. And so she came out to the water, Linda's there with a the towel, and, you know, and, and she's a tall girl, you know, and... <laughs> So she, I get her in front of me, and you know, I'm looking straight ahead, you know, and you know, uh, you know, and I call her name, and I said, "I'm so glad you're getting baptized. Put your hands like this, you know." And and I raised my hand and started in obedience to the command. And when I did that, she took the top off and laid it over my shoulder because she did not want to get it wet. <laughs> Say, what did you do? At that point, you stop talking, just dunk and get him up, and my wife is there with the towel, and we're done. Say, what's the lesson? The lesson is, if you're going to baptize and you tell them to get extra clothes, be very specific, you know, what you want. Now, uh, we, we actually started, we had one of our, uh, one of our men in our church uh, who's a tailor, and he actually made some baptismal gowns for us. So you're going to see some pictures um, <laughs> of baptismal gowns, just so you know, all right? There are no bad pictures here. But understand, understand, missionary, now I, I was, I was so glad nobody had a camera, nobody was taking pictures, but it, it's one of those things that you have to learn culture is different. And that young lady, by the way, that young lady today is still in our, one of our churches. She is there married now with her children, serving with her husband. And, and every once in a while, you know, we'll be at their home for a meal, and she will still look at me and say, Pastor Mark, I cannot believe I did that. <laughs> and I want to say, I can't believe you did either. But, but you know, God is good. He's, he's good all the time. Uh, and, and, you know, people, you know, you, you have to take people where they are, 
and bring them along. And so you're going to see some pictures here. Now, my DVD uh, is about seven or so minutes. Uh, that DVD is, there, there's, no, uh, there's no talking. All right, I'm old school. I'm not going to talk through it. Uh, if you can read, you'll be all right, because I've got some words and letters uh, or, you know, phrases on there. And I want you to see what God has done. The, the emphasis of this DVD is 30 years. I want you to see what God has done. And, and when Paul came back to the church at Antioch, he reported to the church the things that God had done. This is not what I've done or what my wife and I have done together. This is what God has allowed to be accomplished through our ministry. And by the way, you have had a part in this. You're the reason we're still there, 30 years. Uh, and so let's go ahead and show that DVD. And then I'll, now take note, all right, you're going to see a black fella. All right, Pastor Samson, and he's baptizing in a river. And I got a funny story about his baptism. Uh, because Pastor Samson almost drowned somebody, but he did not miss a beat. He rescued him and still continued baptizing. <laughs> so we'll play the video. There should be music.
Let me just make a couple of comments about some of the pictures you saw. Now, we're leaving the DVD here. If, uh, you know, you can share it. Um, one of the things that in that picture, uh, in those DVD, or in the, the, the different pictures in there, are, are people that uh, my wife and I have led to the Lord. There's some, of the, some of them are, are, you know, you see the pictures now. Uh, we won them when they were children. Uh, and and they, they went through our church services, and, and they grew up in our church. Uh, you know, you see people there that uh, when you see me in the, um, when I'm preaching, 30 years of ministry, and I am wearing the brown shirt and the blue badge, uh, that is kind of my prison uniform. Uh, I'm on staff at, at one of the prisons, and they allow me to come in, and I preach and uh, I can't, I'm not allowed to take pictures inside the prison compound itself, but I, I, I was able to get permission to take some pictures of me preaching to the staff, because we do preach to the staff, the guards, and, and great opportunities. And then uh, you saw Pastor Sampson, he's the black fellow that was baptizing in that river. And uh, that was on the 10th anniversary of that church we started in Ghana. And Pastor Sampson was at, we had rain three days before the anniversary service, and we were praying that we wouldn't have any rain on Sunday. Uh, what we didn't anticipate is that water that he was in uh, kind of washed out the river bottom. And Pastor Sampson, that, the lady that was getting ready to be baptized, when he baptized her, Pastor Sampson took a step. He was baptizing, and the way he baptizes is he takes a step over and puts him under, and when he took a step over, he fell into a hole <laughs> and dragged the woman under. And, and Pastor Samson came up, and the woman was floating down the river. And he did not miss a beat. I mean, soaking wet, he got up. You know, he had done this in obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior and upon your public profession, and then went underwater. I mean, he went down. The woman went down. You know, and I'm there taking pictures. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and he comes up out of the water. He's got, you know, he's completely, he's looking around like, where did the lady go? You know, and I'm like, there she is, Pastor Samson. And he reached over, raised to walk in newness of life. You know, and, uh, and it was so funny because, you know, I was very fortunate she had a very large gown on because he grabbed her by the front, you know, and pulled her upright. But uh, the, the, one of the other pictures, I wanted to share kind of a little bit of story with you, and I'm going to have you take your Bibles, and we're going to, I'll talk about some of the other pictures um, because there's some special people there um, in those pictures that today are in heaven. And uh, I'm going to talk about something that's uh, in, in the Bible. So take your Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. I want to I wanna kind of recognize uh, Brother Cal and Karen White. They're over here. They're visiting tonight. And uh, Cal and Karen, uh, we got connected, oh my goodness, uh, when I was here with one of your missions conferences. And, and I got an opportunity to preach at their church. I think you guys lined it up, and I preached in their church. And, uh, and they have been very gracious and kind uh, every month. They support us. And, uh, and they're here tonight, and I'm so grateful because Brother Cal's been going through some physical things, cancer and, and some of the treatments. And they came tonight, and I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for people who give above and beyond. And, and you, there are people in this church who do that, and I'm thankful for that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we want to look at, uh, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 16, uh, 1 to 9. Uh, verse 9 is my text verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, let me just read verse 9 for the sake of time. Paul is talking here, and, and he's talking to the church at Corinth, and he's talking about wanting to come to see them and spend some time with them, and, but he's busy, as every preacher is busy. You know, if you took every invitation, you'd never be in your own pulpit. And, and yet, the, the honest truth is, Paul had a desire to go and visit this church. But one of the things that he says in verse 9, he says, For a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. And tonight I want to speak about the idea of the open door. Because I think sometimes we have this mentality that, you know, uh, the door is closing. And when God says the door is open, there's the door is open. Uh, we sometimes limit God. Uh, God's not limited, you know, by his, on his part. And yet the children of Israel, if you read Psalm 78, the Bible speaks, God, you know, through the psalm writer says, ye limited the Holy One of Israel. 
And even in the New Testament, the Bible talks about Jesus going into certain cities and he could not do many works there because the people limited him. And I want to talk about the open door tonight. Now, just so you know, all right, we are going to, I'm going to talk about money down the road, all right? I am going to talk a little bit about faith promise, not tonight, but in the coming nights, but I'm not going to tell you which night, yeah. all right? Because <laughs> I know how it goes. So he's talking about money on Tuesday, uh, so let's just skip Tuesday. No, you come every night, because I'll tell, I'll tell an exciting story every night, all right? I promise you. I got some good stories, and I have to finish a story, all right? That, that I started one of the last times I was here, all right? We got, I got to have the choir sing that song for me. God is so good, all right? Because that song is special to me. And, and, and it worked in the life of a Muslim man. And, and I, I haven't finished the story. I started it, you know, but years have passed and the story hasn't ended. And, and you got, but you're going to have to come and get it, all right? I'm, I'm going to tell them they can't sell the tape or whatever, all right? But uh, God is good, by the way. God is good. I, I just, you know, I, you know, when you listen to your choir sing, there's some folks that you need to get religion. You sit and listen to what God has given to you here and it never moves you. I do not know how you can sit in this church and not be moved. I do not know. Because I sat over there and listened to the choir and I thought about all the good things that God's done for me. You know, I thought about the times that, you know, there are times that we fall. And when I mean fall, we get discouraged and, and we get down in the mouth. And yet when you get down there, God hasn't forsaken you. You know, it, God's, just, God's just sitting there. It's like, you want to have a pity party? I'll let you have a pity party for a little while. But when you get to your senses, look to me and look what I've done. God has done so much for us. And, and yes, there are times we face problems. I preached a message uh, in Ghana uh, to our people there in Ghana. And, you know, in, in, in the Song of Solomon, the Bible talks about, uh, you know, that Jesus, all right, is the lily of the valleys. You know, he's not the lily of the valley. One. Because you and I have, there's a lot of valleys we go through. And every valley you go through, God is there. Every valley. And, and I, I'm not going to preach it this week, so I'll just tell you the valleys that I talked about. The valley of discouragement. Uh, the valley of disease. The valley of disappointment. Uh, the valley, you know, sometimes the valley of disaster. I mean, everything just seems to be going wrong. You know, and, and the, I mentioned this morning, the valley of decision. When you're facing tough decisions, he's there. And when you get to the last valley, the shadow of death, he's there. I mean, he's the lily of the valleys. And, and, you know, that's why I, I, love the, I love to hear your choir. I could sit here and just say, okay, let's have a choir for the next four or five hours. And I would stay. Choir would probably leave, but I would stay. Because I, I, I'm encouraged by God. Because we are facing valleys even now. And I'm going to talk about this open door. I'm going to talk about what that door represents. And there are three things I want to call our attention to tonight. First is this. I believe that Paul was talking about when he says this door is there, a great door and effectual is open unto me. Number one, it's a door of opportunity. It's a door of opportunity. You know, we, we talk about opportunity knocks. No, I think the door is open. That's the opportunity. You don't need to answer the door. You just need to walk through it. We live in a day and age where there are many opportunities. One of the pictures I showed uh, that, that's on this thing. And again, I, I hope you take it and just look at the pictures and realize, say, I had a part in that. I gave to New Man of Baptist Church in North Carolina. I had a part in that. When you see the sign, this is New Man of Baptist Church and Pastor Henry holding that sign. They're building their own building today. They're building their own building. They're by, they bought a piece of land with their own money. They're building the building with their own money. How did that come about? Because of the opportunity that was there. But one of the men that you see uh, when we did uh, in, in the ministry and church planting, there's a picture where I'm giving a man, it looks like a trophy. And we happen to be in a church, and it's the 10th anniversary of that church. And the man I'm giving the trophy to is actually a, 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 a clock. Because I was, I was doing, a, you know, the, the anniversary celebration for the entire month was on redeeming the time. And I took that entire month, and everywhere I preached in Ghana that month, every sermon was on redeeming the time, a different sermon. 
When I preached in the prison, every sermon was redeeming a time for a whole month. When I preached at the university, every sermon was redeeming. And we did a whole week of, of, of seminars, and every sermon was redeeming the time. The idea that you and I only have so much. There's an open door now. We need to redeem our time. And Kwame, the man that I'm giving the trophy to, and I'm shaking his hand, Kwame Kusijan was one to the Lord in 1988. I did not win him, but he was one at my church. We had a revival, and, and we did not have a lot of money. We knew our building would not hold the crowd. Dr. Don Sisk, who was the president of BIMI at that time, had come to Nigeria, and he was actually visiting churches around the world. He had just become the, the, the director of BIMI, and he was kind of making a trip around the world and stopping at every continent and visiting some of our missionary churches. And he contacted me, said, I'm coming to Nigeria. And I said, well, if you come to Nigeria, give me three days because I'm doing a revival and I don't have to preach it because every revival in Nigeria is kind of like a home revival, except when you came. We call it a home revival because Pastor Mark's doing the preaching. But when I get a chance to have somebody else preach, I want him to do it. So we rented some tents, but only for the people who were coming. We built a little platform, and it was outside, and it was the rainy season. And so I, you know, the, the preacher, we had a pulpit out there. We had our choir on the platform, and I told, the, the, you know, Dr. Sisk, I said, now, you're in charge. When we start the preaching, and I turn it over to you, you are in charge. We had two sermons every night. And I said, when you start, you run everything. And I said, if it starts to rain... You have to stop the service. We'll get the choir under the tents, and then you just preach under the tents without a PA system. You just walk around and preach loud. And he's, he understood that. So Saturday night, Sunday night, we, Saturday night, all day Sunday, we had services that had no problem with the rain. God stayed the rain. You know, we thank God for that. But then Monday came, dark clouds. And the choir was sitting there, six o'clock, or, or five, I'm sorry, five o'clock, we started the service, and, and we, we had the first service, first sermon, no problems. Dr. Sis got up to close out the revival meeting. He had his Bible open, and the choir had just finished their song. Linda was sitting with the choir. I was sitting in my chair. Dr. Sis got up to preach, and he opened his Bible, and he read his text, and it started to rain. And I thought, you know, I closed my Bible and thought, okay, I'm getting ready to stand up because he's going to stop the service and we're going to get under the tent. Dr. Sisk closed his Bible and turned it this way. And then he started to walk on the platform. I accused him later of he was trying to miss the raindrops because we couldn't move. And Dr. Sisk did not stop. He preached in the rain. My choir was sitting there. My wife's hair was straight. I mean, everybody was so... Nobody said anything. We'd listen. And Dr. Sis, when he got to the end of his sermon, rain was still coming down. Everybody under the tent where he's preaching was completely dry. But outside, we were soaked. And Dr. Sis gave an invitation. And he said this. He said, now, if you want to get saved tonight, you're going to have to come from under there where it's dry to out here where it's wet and we will deal with you out here in the rain and that night 52 people Amen. came out from under the tent we thank God for little favors no lightning because we were under trees leading people to the Lord the last man who came out that night was a man by the name of Kwame Kusijan I had a group of people, and all of our soul winners had people. Linda had people, and, and even the directors, other directors from BIMI, other white guys, they came out, and they were dealing with people under trees and, you know, little groups. Kwame came out into the rain. Dr. Sisk said, how can I help you? And Kwame said, I want to be saved. There was no other soul winner, so Dr. Sisk led him to the Lord right there by the platform and got soaking wet. That was in 1988. Kwame got a full dose of salvation. His wife got saved. His four kids got saved. 
He got busy in the church. He was just a layman. God never called him to preach other than go soul winning and preach. In 2001, we de- uh, in 2000, uh, Pastor Samson, God called him to be a missionary. He was in our Bible Institute. Pastor Samson, I sent him to Ghana to spy out the land. And Pastor Samson came back and said, I'm going to start a church in this place. And Linda and I, we packed up everything and we moved to that place with Pastor Samson. Turned over the church that I was pastoring. And I said, we'll come and help start this church. And Kwame, the guy who got saved in 1988... He went to his boss and said, I need six weeks off because I'm going to help start a brand new church. As a layman, as a layman, our brother here who's retiring wants to do help. That works. It works. And so we we went to Ghana and we went to the city and and we, we found a place to start meeting. And we waited. We, we, well, the way I start a church is, you know, find a building, and then we spend six weeks of soul winning every day. Six weeks of soul winning to get our name out there. And then after six weeks, we have the first service. And so we found a building, and we were renting a school building, and we painted it. Spend the mornings, you know, 6 o'clock in the morning until about 10 o'clock, painting the building, get it ready for church. And then go home and we'd have lunch. Linda would have lunch for us. And Linda and I could go soul winning together. Pastor Samson needed a partner and that's why Kwame came. And so then we would go about noon until about 6 o'clock in the evening. Go soul winning. And we started the church after 6 weeks. And Kwame called his boss and said let me stay an additional 2 weeks. Because I'm going to have to help Pastor Samson. And so that picture you saw where I am giving the trophy or that clock to that person, that man who's receiving the clock wearing a shirt and a tie and a coat, his name is Kwame. He redeemed the time. Now, if you read my prayer letters, the last prayer letter you have out here is the 20th of November. You'll be getting a new one in about two weeks. The 20th of November, I wrote and said, pray for Kwame because he had prostate cancer and he was going to have to have surgery. And I talked to Dr. Ocean, who's my friend, who I won to the Lord. And he was going to do the surgery. And Linda and I, basically, with the help of the churches in Nigeria, Pastor Samson and his church and some deacons in his church, we got enough money to provide for, Pastor, for, for Kwame's surgery. Because Kwame deserved our help. He saw an opportunity. He looked at that door and said, that's an opportunity for me to do something. See, there are a lot of people who think that the pastor should get all the glory because he has to do everything. Pastor's not supposed to do everything. There's supposed to be some folks that, you know, like Aaron and her that lifted the arms of Moses. That's an opportunity. The next prayer letter you get that you'll put on the board will talk about Kwame going to heaven. He didn't survive a surgery. But he left a legacy. That while he was here, that door that was open in front of him, he said, I will go through it. You know, you live here in North Carolina. How many doors are open that you just walk by? How many doors? Every one of us has an open door in front of us. And it's a door of opportunity. What are you going to do with it? I wonder what we're going to face when we get to heaven and God's going to say, well, I gave you this opportunity You know, and we're going to say, well, uh, the preacher didn't see that. And God's going to say, I didn't mean for your preacher to see it. I meant for you to see it. And Kwame did what he could. And and I'm thankful that I had the privilege to know a, a man who gave his, though he worked a, what we call a secular job, he did what he could, and when the opportunity came, he said, I'm willing to sacrifice to see a church. Now, you understand, Kwame never preached in that church, never preached there. And when he was there, the 10th anniversary, Linda and I paid to bring him from Ghana. He did not know we were going to honor him. But let me tell you what, what, who Kwame was. He came to the church. We honored him. 
He's a member of a church in Nigeria that I started. He's visiting that church on their 10th anniversary. He's got the, his Bible. He's got his little clock that says redeeming the time. I get up to preach. Kwame is sitting in the back. When, when, when the preaching's done and the invitation's done, immediately Kwame stands up, starts looking for somebody to win to Christ. He knew there were a lot of visitors. And I mean, the next thing I know, I see Kwame taking some guy, because I had said, okay, if you're not sure you're saved, but you're concerned about it, raise your hand. And I mean, the way we do it in Nigeria, I have people raise their hand, and I send my soul winners out to grab the hands, to take them out and talk to them. And I, I was standing in the in pulpit of Samson. Pastor Samson is there. I start the invitation. Kwame sitting in the back. I say, if you're not sure you're saved, raise your hand. Kwame stands up. He's looking around like, okay, I'm ready. Where are they at? Yeah. And as soon as the hands start going up, Kwame, and that service, he won four people to the Lord. A layman. He did not seek glory. He saw an open door, a door of opportunity where he could help a friend by the name of Pastor Samson. When was the last time you helped your friend, Pastor Tony? When's the last time? But see, we, 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 we want, you know, the great church, but we want somebody else to do it. And the Apostle Paul said, I, I see an open door here, a great open door. And I think that's a door of opportunity. Now, there's another thing you need to understand, just so you know. The second thing I see about this door, Paul said it's an open door, it's an effectual door. But he also said it's a door of adversity, or what I call it for my outline, a door of opposition. Ladies and gentlemen, I tell you all kinds of good stories. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of like when you read Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, there's two different things you need to see in Hebrews 11. The first part of Hebrews 11 is I call the, 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 the uh, <laughs> you know, the, the faith is the victory. But about Hebrews 11, like 34, 35, you know, it talks about, you know, those who were sawn asunder. That's not victory in man's eyes. And so there is sometimes, there's the bad stuff. You know, it was ABC Wide World of Sports used to be the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. And the adversaries will come out of the woodwork. Now listen to me. When you get these new young missionaries coming through, all right, the young man who's going to go start a church, listen, the adversaries come to you. The opposition starts when you're in America. You're going to have family say you're stupid. You're going to have friends say you're ignorant for doing this. You're going to have financial problems. You know, deputation is not easy. You're going to have fickle friends. Do you realize today the average missionary, from what I understand, the average missionary starting out on deputation takes anywhere between two years and four years to raise enough money to get to the mission field. Now, I told you the story this morning, you know, when your preacher was talking about the crock pot. You know, the, you know, one preacher got a, you know, on his anniversary, he got a car. Another preacher got a crock pot. You know, and, and the entitlement mentality. And I told you that, you know, in Nigeria, I did. And, and, uh, the, the Independent Baptist Church, the deacons decided they wanted to give me a car. And they went out and bought a Toyota Crown. It's a huge car. Big old boat of a car. And they gave it to me. And you talk about totally surprised on my part. Because if they'd have given me the money, I'd have bought a small car. You know, but they, this was something they could do to honor their pastor. But you understand, the opposition immediately came out. Because missionaries normally on the foreign field are not allowed to collect money. I know there's a lot of people, oh, we you know these missionaries, they're all trying to get money. They ought to be tent makers. They ought to be working a job someplace. If I could, I would, but I can't. Now, it's not that I'm, I'm lazy. But you understand, I cannot get a visa. My visa, when we travel to Nigeria, when we travel to Ghana, I have to sign documents. I will not take money. And I, I thought, well, you know, I followed the law because I didn't take money. I took a car. <laughs> you know, and it really was in the name of the church. But you understand, you say, well, how did the government find out? A jealous missionary. Opposition. Opposition. There was a jealous missionary. He was upset that my church... Love God enough to take care of their pastor missionary. 
And he got upset and called the government officials on me. Now, you understand, the devil is going to fight us. All right? That's why it's a door. But Paul uses the word adversary. I'm using the word opposition. There are, you're going to face opposition. All right? You know, when you get to the field, when you get to the field, all right, these missionaries, when they get to the field, they will face opposition. All right? You face opposition sometimes from the government. You know, now you, when you get off an airplane in a foreign country, they're not going to open their arms. I've got two cartoons, my favorite <laughs> cartoons. I've actually got three, but I'm not allowed to have the other one in Africa because I've got one that's got, you know, Muhammad with a bomb on his head. And, and then I've got another one where, where um, Garfield the cat is carrying a bomb to his owner, John. And he's wearing it, and, and Garfield is wearing a turban. And he's coming to John, and he said, get ready to die, infidel. I've got nine lasagnas waiting for me in heaven. <laughs> you know, that's funny to me. All right, some people don't like it. That's funny to me. I like that. But, but I've got two cartoons you know, that I have in, in Africa. One of them is a missionary getting off an airplane. And, and the, there's, there's the, the Africans are there with a big sign that says, Yankee, go home. And then the next one, the guys turn the sign around and says, but leave your dollars here. Another cartoon, basically the same premise. The missionary is getting off the airplane. Yankee, go home. And then the next the guy's turned his sign around and says, and take me with you. Yeah. Yeah. But you understand, we face opposition. All right, you may have an open door, but the devil is going to fight you. That's why you need to pray for your missionaries. Pray that they will be faithful. Because sometimes it's just a matter of time. Let me give you one of my, you know, it's, it's one of my favorite stories. Uh, in, Niger in Ghana, Pastor Samson and I, we had started the church, and the Fellowship Track League in Lebanon, Ohio, prints a lot of tracks. And they, were, they, they had asked me about some of their tracks, and they were trying to draw covers on the tracks that would be appropriate for Africa. So they were changing, you know, instead of having all kind of white people, they got some pictures of African people, and they, you know, had their artists draw some pictures. One of the tracks was uh, the title, I Must Tell You This. And they had a picture of an African boy, about 10 years old. Great picture. So uh, Dr. Wash Pennington, who was a pastor at the time, said, Brother Six Day, we're going to send you 10 and a half million tracks. And they jam them inside these containers. You can't hardly get them out. And so Pastor Samson and I, we, you know, we were tracking this. You know, okay, when did the tracks come? And it's so funny. I mean, they sent the documents. We never got the documents. The devil was fighting us because the devil did not want us to have those tracks in, in, Niger in Ghana. We were going to share them with a whole bunch of churches. And finally, you know, I called Dr. Pennington. I said, man, I said, I don't have the documents yet. But according to you, it was not, the, the tracks were on a ship. And in Ghana, or they, they, in the newspaper, they tell you what ships are docking. You know, you can get that information from their newspapers. And I said, the ship is in port. I need the documents. So they had to FedEx the documents to me. Samson and I went from Kumasi. We went to the port. We got there, and we found our container. And it was offloaded from the ship. It was put in an area of the port. It was the bottom container, five others on top of it. At least we knew where it was at. And so we, we were all excited, you know, and, and we said, we'll come back tomorrow. We got a clearing agent. Overnight, overnight, they tore up the road for that section of the port. Just got bulldozers and tore it up. We went to the port. I had, my, I had my documents, you know, and, and Samson was going, it's like, well, Pastor Mark, you let me handle it. I'll talk to the people. We, you know, I don't want them to see you because, you know, you're a white guy and they're going to see dollar signs. So finally, Samson comes back after, you know, uh, two days at the port. He comes back and says, Pastor Mark, you're going to have to come. He said, they won't release it. They're not going to go to that section. They say it's going to stay there for two months till they fix the road. And I'm like, I can't afford to spend the money to keep that container there. So I went to the port. You know, Linda, you know, she didn't go because, you know, going to the port, she had nothing to do there. It's like, go ahead and go, you know, and her job at that point was praying. So I went to the port with Pastor Samson. I was dressed like I dressed for, you know, you know out there, just a shirt and a tie because I was meeting government officials. And I went to the container. Samson took me to the container. They had this huge tractor thing, big wheels, taller than me. And, and the kind of thing that could lock on top of a 20-foot of a container and pick it up. And I told Samson, I said, well, man, 
I said, that machine can go over the tore up road. All he has to do is move four containers and ours is ready. And Samson said, they won't do it. And I said, well, who's in charge of this mess? You know, and so Samson took me to an office. And there in the office was a man sitting behind the desk, and he was a Muslim guy. You know, he takes my paperwork, and he looks at me. You know, I'm there very respectful. You know, and you know, he says, well, what's in the container? Now, at that point, you want to say playing cards, you know, Coca-Cola, anything. But, oh, it's gospel tracks to win people. So he's sitting there, and you know what? He's got the manifest in front of him. And I said, sir, I said, I'm a missionary. I said, my name is Pastor Mark. I said, I'm a missionary. I said, it's gospel tracts. We use them in our church for evangelism. And, I said, and he said, well, for how many churches? And I said, oh, a whole bunch. We're going to put them all over Ghana. I said, there's 10 and a half million tracts in there. And he said, well, where is it at? And I said, well, the container's over here. There's a big berm of asphalt. that they." And I said, it's the bottom container. And I said, I really need that today. And he looked at me and said, okay, sign the papers. He called the, the crane operator, and he said, you go with this pastor, and you take care of him and get his container out of here today. You know, that's, you say, boy, Pastor Mark, you're powerful. No, you know who's powerful? The wife who's praying. That's the one who had power that day. We faced opposition, but you know what? She's knocking him down like she's bowling. Just knocking him down. We get that, now, now by that time, the crane operator gets it. We, you know, Samson's running around trying to get a truck because we got to get the container off the port. It's Friday. And so we get the container, and they're supposed to put it on a truck, and then they've got to drive it through an x-ray machine to make sure there's no, nothing fake in it. Then they get it off the port, and we're going to unload it to another truck and then return the container back to the port to get our deposit. We got the truck inside the port. They put the container on the truck. We drive to where the x-ray machine is, where they inspect the containers. And we get up there, and the power goes off for the entire city of Tama. It's gone. The man who's in charge, we can't take the trucks through. They're going to have to sit here. And I mean, I'm walking around frustrated because now it's 4 o'clock. Port closes at 5. i got to get this container off. See, there's opposition. Yes, but listen to me. All you need is, you know, about a 5-foot, 4-inch wife who prays. Yeah. Because she can knock the opposition. So I went up to the top boss there and I said, Sir, I said, uh, listen, thank you for helping me. We got the container, but I can't get it off the port. And he said, what's the problem? I said, well, you don't have electricity here. They don't have it at the x-ray machine. And I said, is there anything we can do? And he said, well, we can do a physical inspection. I said, do it. I've got nothing to hide. So here comes this Muslim guy. He walks out to the container. He said, bring that truck up here. He said, break the seal, open it up. You know, and, and when Dr. Pennington loads a container, he puts a big sign inside the container. So the first thing you see when you open it up is, to God be the glory, ten and a half million tracks. And I know that sign's there. I know it. So here's the Muslim guy, you know, okay, open it up. We're going to inspect it. They open that. And of course, you know, I'm the guy who's like, okay, wait, can we take a few pictures? We're not supposed to take pictures. Samson, get up there. You know, I'm taking pictures of Samson, to God be the glory, ten and a half million tracks. And the Muslim guy said, now, what do you need to do? And he said, well, we've got to inspect some boxes. I said, pick any box you want, any one. And, and they, they literally pound those, the last boxes in because it's so tight to get 1,080 boxes in that 20-foot container. But they put a strap around one so you can grab it and jerk it out. And so the Muslim guy said, pull that box. And they grab it and jerk it out. And I carry a knife with me everywhere I go in Africa. And so I, I, I said, just jerk that out. And I said, you can take any box. You can unload the entire container. There's 1,080 boxes. You can take anything you want. And so we, he jerked that one out. And they put it on a, a uh, where they backed the truck up. There was a, a, a ta table there. And they put that box there. And I pulled out my knife. Flipped the blade out. It's like a switchblade, but it's not actually a switchblade. 
And I, I flipped the knife and I slid open the box so he could look at it. And this Muslim man, when he opened the box, the track that he saw was the track that said, I must tell you this, with a 10-year-old African boy looking at it. And that Muslim fella, he reached in. I understand, he reached in, took that track, and walked away. He said, they can go. They can go. And the other guys were grabbing tracks, and I said, you can take whatever you want. You know, they wanted some tracks for their ministry. And this Muslim guy literally walks away. And he takes, he takes a handful of tracks and sticks them in his pocket. And he walks away. He said, that container can be clear. Take it. Take it. So a great missionary, Mark 6, said, no, prayer warrior. Because the opposition. Now, I, I, we got the container out. We got the tracks to where we needed to get them. We continued to pray. And I decided I wanted to go back to the port and see to personally thank the Muslim guy because he helped me. So I had a couple of books I wanted to give him, you know, books on evangelism, you know, books that would give the gospel. So I went back to the port and, and I, I asked him if I could buy him a mineral. It was near noon. A mineral is just like saying, I want to buy you a Coke. You know, I went to his office and he was there and I said, you remember me? I'm Pastor Mark. And he said, oh, yes, Pastor Mark. And I said, could I buy you a mineral? I'd just like to talk to you just for a few minutes. And he said, sure. And he took a break. We went to a little canteen there. We sat at a table. And, and you know, I said, I want to thank you for helping me get that container out. I said, you went above and beyond. And, and he kind of lowered his head. And the Holy Spirit nudged me and said, talk to him. So I asked him, I said, can I ask you a question? And he said, sure. And I said, when, you open, when we opened that box, you reached in and you took some of those leaflets. And I said, you put them in your pocket and immediately you walked away. You, as you were walking away, you just said, the container can go. And I said, why did you do that? And literally tears in his eyes. And he said, Pastor Mark, he said, I have a 10-year-old son. And he said, when I saw that, I must tell you this. He said, I wondered what a 10-year-old African boy needed to tell me. And I said, did you read that track? And he reached in his pocket. He had, he had signed the back. He had signed the back of that track. Opposition. Say, oh, Brother Sigstead, you're such a great missionary. No, it had nothing to do with me. It had everything to do with the prayer warrior. You know why we need your prayers? Because we face opposition every day. And the honest truth is I can't sit down and write a prayer letter and say, I need your prayers right now. I need you to be praying all the time. Because I do not know what God's going to put in my way. And I don't know what the devil's going to put in my way. But I do know this. God is interested. And I told this story to Dr. Pennington, and he wrote it in his On Track magazine. You know what he titled it? How Far God Would Go to Save One Soul. To turn the power off. God made it so that this man, that contain because if we'd have been just able to run that container through, that guy would have never seen the track. But God went through. Say, well, what's the rest of the story, Pastor Mark? Several months later, I was able to get back to that city, and on Easter Sunday, I baptized that guy. And he wanted me to baptize him at the port. So everybody could see it. Say, oh, Brother Six Dead, you're such a great... No, I'm not a great missionary. I have a great prayer warrior. And I have a great God. And so, yes, we face opposition. But you can have a part in removing that opposition. Last is this. And I've gone over and I, I thank you for listening. The last thing is this. I think the open door signifies not only a door of opportunity and door of opposition... But I think it signifies a door of obligation. You know, the Bible says, you know, we, we use this, you know, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And we stop there. But the next few verses in Romans chapter 10, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? 
And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? It speaks, it speaks of four different things. The sinner, how shall they call on him? It speaks of the Savior, that's the him. How shall they call on him in whom they have not heard? It speaks of the servant, how shall they hear without a preacher? And then it speaks of the church, how shall they preach except they be sent? You will hear about open doors this week. And the reason God is putting it in front of you is because God wants to lay an obligation on you. you I, if I was at New Man of Baptist Church in Marion, North Carolina, preacher, I would be very comfortable here. I would. I love this place. You've got sound preaching. There's good people. You walk in, I can feel the love. But the obligation that God puts on all of us is the world. As the preacher said, now he left out, he was saying Judea, Samaria, and other, he left out Jerusalem, and I think he left it out on purpose because he knew we're reaching our Jerusalem. Jerusalem is Marion, but the uttermost parts of the earth, Romania, Washington, Greece, the, uh, the, the multi-flags here, that's an obligation. I want you to think tonight, we're going to have an invitation in just a moment. This is a hard message to give an invitation to because it's mostly information. Yeah. The honest truth is, is I, I want you to ask yourself tonight, what am I doing with the obligation God has placed in front of me, the open door, because I am a member of this church and what this church is doing, what God wants to do more through this church. What is my responsibility? You got to start praying about your faith promise. Tonight's a good time to start. Father, we thank you for the word of God. Thank you, Father, for what Paul spoke of to the Corinthians, this great door. Father, I'm thankful for all that you have allowed to pass through my life and the life of Linda and me. Father, the churches and Father, the good people that we know, and Father, the pastors, as we've talked about, Pastor Samson, and Father, Pastor Moses, and Pastor G. Day, and all the pastors, Father, that you have allowed us to be a part of their lives. But Father, there's a greater obligation in front of us. It seems as though, Father, we're losing ground. Father, I know you're still in control. I know we still have this door of opportunity in front of us. I know, Father, there's opposition. I know that. But Father, more importantly, I know that there's an obligation we have. You have given, the Bible teaches, unto whom much is given, much is required. And Father, you have been so good to us here. Now, Father, I pray tonight, then in just the next few moments, your people would look at their own heart. And Father, desire tonight first to do more, and Father, begin praying about what you want them to do, what it is. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, you be honest with me. Say, Pastor Mark, 